Zach Laws of Gold Derby here with Catherine Bostick. She's the composer of the new film Clemency. Uh, and Catherine, you know, this movie is a really powerful and at times hard to watch look at capital punishment and our criminal justice system. I just want to know, starting off, like what your reaction was to the script or the finished film, whichever one you got first, um, you know, just purely on an emotional level before you even started thinking about how you wanted to mm. work on it. Well, you know, I first read the script um, after meeting with the director, Chinonye, and the lead producer, Bronwyn Cornelius. I read the script, and it is so, it's so visceral. It is so riveting in terms of just the, that raw emotion that you feel when you deal with the idea of death row and what does that mean and, and who's incarcerated and why. So it brought up a lot of different issues for me in terms of judgment, the penal system in this country, the systemic racism that continues to go, go on in this country with regard to incarcerated um, black and brown men and women in particular. But more than that, um, I was really moved by the inner journey of, of the character of the warden to really understand, oh, wow, that's right. These people, they're, they're, they are dealing with this rite of passage um, of, you know, uh, of death. And how does that affect them? How does that, how do they handle that? Right. I mean, I think that um, obviously um, everyone has their own opinions about the death penalty. And, you know, going to this movie, you're either going to have your views solidified or you're going to have your views changed or you're going to have your views challenged. What's, in, what's interesting is that, you know, you mentioned the inner journey of this character played by Alfred Woodard. And I think that's the part of the movie that is the most surprising because we think of this <clears throat> in terms of the inmates and the people who are being executed, but thinking about it in terms of the person who is having to carry out that execution, that's a really different uh, perspective. And so I wonder, uh, how did you chart that emotional journey of this woman? Well, you know, it was a very, it was a very um, thoughtful process. We tried a lot of different approaches sonically to capture the emotional quality of, of Bernadine because she's she's so compartmentalized. She's got, I mean, like everything has to be in place so she can deal with the ordeal of her day-to-day -day existence in this, in this prison system. So I, I had to really think about making sure that the music reflected that kind of an undertow, reflected that kind of, of, of an inner kind of groundswell that you, you try to keep it contained, but there's an absolute rhythm, an absolute momentum that is growing. Um, and, and how do you create that as a part of that visceral storytelling without at the same time being overly sensationalized about it? Right. Uh, well, just give us a, a little bit of the nuts and bolts, if you will, uh, you know, like instrumentations, thematic things like that you used in order to capture that while at the same time, uh, you know, uh, exercising that that restraint you're talking about. <clears throat> well, um, we tried there were there were several approaches. We tried a lot of vocal textures to sort of reflect her inner voices that were sort of careening into this mm -hmm. troubled uh this troubled terrain of her soul. We tried um, uh, some orchestral, light orchestral palette. We tried a lot of different things. And finally, um, when I was looking at some of the notes from the director, she mentioned, you know, the, the hands on the clock ticking, the, the, the way in which rhythm and pulse are used throughout the day-to-day -day routine of these prisoners, the walks that they take, the steps they take, and, and also the steps Bernadine's character takes with them. So I begin to value the importance of pulse, that sort of um, the inner heartbeat, obviously, but also the heartbeat of, of, this, of this place. And so I begin to come up with different tones that had pulse to them, and I began to sort of juxtapose them with um, 
other other pulses to sort of counterpoint that. And I also did on some of the cues, I did do some very light vocal overlays that I thought would enhance um, some of the the moments when she's, you know, in, in dream state. So you hear some of that. And then um, on another level, I also got to, to write a song uh, called Slow Train that's in the scene when she's in the bar and reflects the demise of her, her, her marriage, the blues. So I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit more about that song in a bit. Uh, but one of the things that struck me watching this movie was how much it allows for silence. You know, yeah. um, there's a lot of emotion that's conveyed from the actors that's unspoken. And, you know, your music in a lot of ways has to help provide that as well. Can you talk a bit about that? Well, you know, for me, silence is it's music. It's a musical tool in that you are able to sit inside this deep place of of not being informed and in that way your own emotional response is coming from a, a place that that is is reflective of your your initial instinct so um the sparseness i think is serves this story very well because it reflects as i said the the way in which the character Bernadine keeps everything micromanaged. She keeps everything under strict, you know, uh, lockdown, if you will, to to keep her emotions at bay. So there's a distancing. There's there's a moat. There's um, an inability to access, and that means you are going to have silence. You are going to not always be distracted by sound. And so when the music does come in, when the score does come in, I think it's very, very effective. I think it's um, uh, almost um, not so much a, a welcome relief because it's not that kind of a score, but it, it, it accentuates a lot of the key moments in, in the turns of this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, did the character of Anthony Woods, played by Aldous Hodge, the inmate who's um, <clears throat> who's on death row, did his story um, enter into your um, into your work at all as well? Yes, it did. Um, when we were talking about some of the textures, um, Chinonye wanted the vocal quality there to be a lower voice to sort of reflect also his his inner journey. So some of the lower tones and the lower voicings are also a, a reflection of his character. So they're a similar palette to Bernadine, but they're they're nuanced just enough that they're specific towards him. However, when these two worlds, these two sonic worlds do mesh, there there is a seamlessness to to their interaction. I wanted to kind of create that as well, sonically. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us a little bit more about that song you wrote, Slow Train. Um, <clears throat> was it always, um, was it always that you were going to do this in addition to your score work? Yeah, we talked about the blues being a, a character in the, in the movie. Um, you know, the blues being something that Bernadine would listen to with her husband and we talked about what kind of of a sentiment we wanted this particular song to have. So when I wrote Slow Train, uh, it, as I said, it comes in um, at the time when um, Bernadine is in the bar and she is reflecting on her troubled marriage. So um, I wanted to write a, a, a song about that that loneliness that you have, you know, when you're when your relationship is, is falling apart and you're trying to salvage, you're trying to salvage it. Mm -hmm. um, so you've worked with uh, some really talented, great directors uh, in your career, uh, mm -hmm. people like Ava DuVernay and Justin Simeon. How does Chinoye Chukwa uh, stand up beside them? I mean, uh, <laughs> this is... <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't, I don't do comparisons. I mean, everybody that I've worked with is extraordinary. Everybody that I've worked with has their own autonomy and their own vision. So I don't, I feel so fortunate because I don't 
ever do that kind of comparison. I just go full into the the relationship that involves my collaboration with, with the director and producers I'm working with. And I've been really fortunate. I've worked with August Wilson. I just worked on the Toni Morrison documentary uh, and, and got to just marinate in that vibe of her, her stature. So, you know, everybody brings something very unique um, and purposeful to their work that I think inspires me and helps me as a composer and as a person who's collaborating with them. And what did Genoia bring to this one? I mean, certainly, um, you, you know, she's made some shorts and a little micro budget movie before, but this is a really impressive kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, putting herself out there into the world uh, debut for a lot of people. So what did she give you that helped you with your work? Oh my goodness, so much. I mean, she's so, she's so passionate um, about this particular subject matter and her activism is reflected in every ounce of this script and in every ounce of the choices she made in the creative team and the direction she gave. So that passion and that dedication to this particular cause of justice and injustice, it, it, it inspired me and fueled me. And, um, and I just appreciate that, you know, her storytelling comes from such a place of, of of authenticity and truth it's her truth speak and i love working in that kind of a parameter you know i love working with people who who really have that dedication to their own voice uh speaking of people who had a dedication to their own voice you mentioned you worked on the tony morrison documentary this year as well uh the piece i am uh i wanted to ask you you know with morrison gone from the world now um you know this movie uh, that movie uh has a lot more significance you know um so i wonder if you could just talk a bit about working on that film and and what it meant to you to to be able to lend your talents to a film about a woman who uh, touched so many people with her words uh, and that you know her her loss this year has felt such a great impact you know all over the world this um, this collaboration as composer and songwriter on the Toni Morrison film was a huge gift for me. For me, excuse me, because I'm I've been so. I mean, I can't really find the right words to speak about the impact Toni Morrison and her writing and her beingness have had on me and and and. The massive. I mean, she's just a true, a true literary genius and literary truth speaker of, especially of the African American um, stories and lifestyle and trials and tribulation. And so, to work on this was an extraordinary gift. And the director Timothy Greenfield Sanders and the editor Johanna. Giebel House gave me a lot of uh, leeway. They gave me a lot of flexibility. So I came up with a lot of different type of what I like to call my sonic menus. Some were jazz quartet, some were solo bass, some were solo piano, some were vocal. And we just, it just flowed. It was so effortless. It was one of the most effortless scores I've ever done because the, the energy field of Toni Morrison is so... It it, 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 it still has such a depth to it. It has such a resonance that if you immerse yourself in that, you, you're going to have, it's going to be a win. Yeah. You just have to, you just have to really divinate Tony. Yeah. <laughs> Tony divination. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I reread a bunch of her books after she, uh, after she passed away and, uh, you know, that and, uh, and, and watching this documentary, you know, I think that, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a loss, but at least we have her works and we have this yeah. film to be able to remember her by, you know, her voice will never be lost because of that, you know. That's right. Um, before I let you go, um, this movie, of course, is uh, it uh, won the jury prize at Sundance. It's gotten Independent Spirit nominations uh, for, for Alfrey and uh, Chinoye and, and for the film itself. Uh, the reaction to this movie, which is not an easy watch, but no. it is an important one. 
What does that mean for you? Well, you know, I think that this movie provides a heightened conversation and awareness about, as I said, just the, the justice system, the infrastructure of it, the infrastructure of, of a lot of the legislation and the way in which we as a society view justifying death um, and how we view, I mean, there's, it's such a complex issue. It's such, as you said earlier, people have so many different opinions about, um, about death row, about inmate incarceration, about the systemic racism that runs through it or not in some people's idea. I just hope that the conversation not only continues, but that that there's a sense of reflection to really think about this human experience that we have, this, this human condition, this human conditioning that we have that socializes us in ways at times where we can just be completely naive or, or be uh, dogmatic. And just, you know, issues about judgment for me are very important, especially now. These are very intense times uh, uh, where things are at a tipping point worldwide in terms of um, people's sensibility of what's fair, what's right, entitlement, all this stuff. And these are all constructs at the end of the day, for me, they're all constructs that serve as a way of distracting from the essence of humanity. So I'm hoping that this film will enable people to maybe have a little, a little reflection about humanity in and of itself. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable movie, and uh, it was a pleasure talking with you about it. Thank you again. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.